I've never been to Norway. Northern Journey is a 2021 cinematic fantasy FPS made by one dude. Depending on your experience with Jank, that sentence either told you everything you need to know about this game, or told you nothing at all. I'm here to assure you that this game is what happens when love and raw talent doesn't have the budget or team to back it up. This game is in the same category as Jank masterpieces like Brigid Owaka, but I'll tell you right now that it's far more stable and high quality than that would imply. That isn't to say it isn't broken. A vital NPC didn't load for me the first time I played, but the game is also complete with few hard crashes. I was able to play from beginning to end with no cheating required, which is rare for these types of games. Ustin, better known as Slid Studio, did an excellent job at making this game, and I knew immediately that I wanted to review it just so I can shove it in people's faces and tell them to go play it. So what is the game actually about? Well, Norway? You play as a nameless traveler who is just minding his own business when someone shoots holes into his rowboat. Not able to swim, this strands him on a small isle filled with mythological monsters and very, very ugly people. Like, inside and out ugly? Like, are you sure they aren't monsters level of ugly? Like, ooh boy, that is one ugly motherfuck. So yeah, with a wandering flute player to guide us, we uncover the secrets of the island and try to find our way off it. The game itself is weird and charming. While I know the classics, such as witches and demons, a lot of the mythical creatures in this game were specific enough to Norwegian folklore that it was a brand new and fascinating experience. It's like being on the receiving end of a cultural exchange, and my basic American ass was thankful to be learning new and fascinating mythologies, even if those mythologies were kind of terrifying. We need to cover a couple things before we jump headfirst into the story. First is the graphics. While just playing the game, the environmental graphics are great. The developer did the textures from scratch, going out and manually photographing foliage and textures to use in his game. The result is a pleasant mix of dreary but colorful environments, invoking that look reserved for Scandinavian and Celtic locations. Just looking around, you'll get a lot of screenshot-worthy imagery. The problem with this type of detail is how much it fucks with bit rates. Sprint through this game and the grass might blur a little. Not a big deal, and it complements the speed. Try to record that gameplay, and the file size will be ridiculously large, and a bit pixelated here and there. Try to stream it and forget it. The grass will turn into a pixelated blur worthy of a pornographic film being shown on primetime. It's not something worth changing in-game, as it's the fault of YouTube and Twitch for overly crunching everything. Just know that no matter how hard I try, YouTube is going to crunch the foliage of this video into a pixelated mess. I'm going to do what I can to keep this video watchable, but there's only so much I can do. Just know that the gameplay in this video, and probably most other videos, looks far worse than the actual game by a notable margin. And one last thing to get out of the way, here is a spoiler warning. I'm about to go beat by beat through the story, spoiling everything. I will, however, be spoiling it in a linear fashion. So, if at any point you decide you want to play this game, simply pause the video, take note of your timestamp, go play the game, and then come back here to compare notes. While I don't think this game is for everyone, you should know just by looking at it if it's right for you or not. We open on a cloudy day in the remote north. We are rowing a boat along the coast of an inlet, but we seem to be lost. Who we are and our history is never given to the player, but considering our armored gloves and proficiency with weapons, we are likely an adventurer or warrior of some kind. Suddenly, a laser? Someone has snipe shot our boat with a laser gun of some kind. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is a historical fantasy setting. Our boat was shot from a distance, specifically a nearby lighthouse, but there are no laser sniper rifles here. I honestly get why the green line was used, though. Communicating a scene like this would have been much harder without it. One could argue the use of an arrow would be a visible way to shoot the boat, but then it wouldn't have been able to sink it. Our boat is going down fast, and we can't swim. In a panic, we row to the nearest shore, the same shore our sniper shot from. We watch our boat sink down into the depths, taking our hope with it. Welcome to Northern Journey. We are only a quick walk away from the lighthouse, but before you think about storming up there, be careful not to slip off the pier.
The way to the lighthouse is blocked off though, so we don't have much of a choice but to take the trail inland. In an interesting move for an FPS game, we start the game with no way to defend ourselves. In fact, this scene is surprisingly peaceful. A nice view of the coast, lush foliage, a pleasantly cloudy overcast, and... This man is... upsetting. This is the traveling flute player. Who he is, or even what he is, we don't know. What we do know is that he is offering us a way home, but first, we need to help him. Now, I know what you're thinking, and yeah, it is very possible he is the sniper who shot our boat. But, we don't exactly have much choice in the matter whether or not to help him. He has our way home, and all we have to do for him is this entire game's worth of quests. Sounds like a fair deal. Two hours later. Anyway, three of his possessions have been stolen by the inhabitants of the nearby village. He wants them back, though he isn't telling us what they are yet. He gives a vague shopping list of objectives, which we can check on in the journal. They actually acknowledge our journal in the dialogue, which is a nice touch. In addition to our objectives, the journal also has our list of items and a map of the game world. Whenever we explore an entire area, that section is added to our map. However, the map is vague and can't be zoomed in. It's good for keeping track of exits and what areas connect where, but don't rely on it too much. It won't tell you any specifics, and this game doesn't use waypoints or other UI in navigation. You'll need to actually pay attention and keep track of where things are and where you need to go. Now given our first set of tasks, we continue up the cliff to the small village of Deadwell. Oh. Oh no. Oh god, no! What is that thing? Alright, we have to address it. While the environments are studying examples of photographic texture work, the character models and textures are... fucking horrendous. I'm gonna be honest here, I absolutely love these characters and models. But in the same way I love a fever dream-like horror game. Something hard to describe visually given jank form. It's great and unique and objectively awful. This is a review after all, and I can't be merciful just because I personally like it. These models are terrible. The humans look more terrifying than the monsters. They all look like balding old men with massive brick fingers and gross faces. The animations are unique and add a lot of nice details, but even they are hurt by stray joints and poor weight painting. Again, to be clear, I actually really like it, but objectively, it's pretty bad. Animals and monsters fare a bit better, but even they are hurt by surprisingly bad texture work. Dude could take amazing photos of the grass, but not of someone's dog? Or at least find a fur texture online? Oh well. That out of the way, the inhabitants of Deadwell are disturbing for entirely different reasons. Let's start with what is likely the first thing you'll see upon entering the town. There is a snake tied up to a post while a dog on a leash angrily barks at it. The snake is clearly a demon, with glowing tattoos and too many eyes. That in mind, the dog is far more terrifying, but I don't think that was on purpose. Next is the village idiot. He is more insane than dumb, and more likely went mad seeing something he wasn't supposed to. He is missing several articles of clothing and is wandering about with bandages wrapped around his eyes. Talking to him, he says the snake is his pet and he found it past a door far away. He also says there is a tree-shaped key in the lighthouse. Next is the sheriff. He doesn't seem to like us very much. The dog outside is his, and he recently jailed what he thinks is an old lady with a skin disease. Said old lady is clearly a demon who will teleport and taunt us in the corner of our eyes. This isn't the only thing in this game that takes advantage of the corner of our eyes mechanic. There are these little imp dudes who show themselves in the corner of our eyes, but will bury themselves if we get too close or watch them directly. No one acknowledges them though, so I have to assume this is just a normal Norwegian thing. Moving on, in the center of the village is the sheriff's son who is in the stocks for tax evasion. In a nice bit of detail, some Uncle Grandpa looking potato kid is shooting berries at the tax evader. Who is this ugly ass kid? There's only three women in the village and I'm pretty sure two wouldn't be giving birth to human children. If it is human. It might not be. Speaking of, we have the mother and her daughter. Gee, I wonder if they are satanic witches. While I know relatively little about Norsk folklore, I assume the witches of this time and place were comparable to the witches of early American settlement and Puritan folklore. In other words, have you ever seen that movie The Witch? Something tells me those aren't normal goats. What's that like to live deliciously? 
The daughter denies it, of course. The mother doesn't seem to be on the same page, though. You nasty, foul human. I want to bite your fingers and inject venomous spit into your blood. We'll be seeing them again soon. Next is the healer. If you stand near her and let her dialogue cycle, she'll heal us. She says some funny stuff, too. She won't overheal us, though, so don't come to her expecting a two-point life heal. She gives us a good reason to stop and visit Deadwell whenever we happen to be in the area. Got to love that free Norwegian healthcare. Haha. <laughs> Anyway, let's go get the heathen beaten out of us over at the church. Oh, jeez. I mean, it's not as good as that one Jesus painting, but isn't it a bit grim? I mean, it's nice, but... Oh fuck, it's the priest! For real though, the priest is clearly hiding something under the church. One of our objectives is to get into the church's cellar, but a heavy rock blocks the way. We can hear something getting angry underneath, but the priest denies everything. With that, the door out of town opens up, letting us explore the rest of the Deadwell region. The area as a whole is set up on or near the cliff sides. Rivers cut through and empty out to the coast. The view of the fjord is gorgeous, but anyone with a fear of heights is going to have a bad time. Just out of town, we are greeted by the flute player again. He instructs you to get the key from the lighthouse and head into the forest. He also tells us to find the inventor and beg him for a weapon. Behind him is an elevator missing a crank and a woodsman's cabin. You ever see those pictures of houses built in precarious places? Those ones where you can't help but nope out at the side of? The elevator and the woodsman's cabin sit in this category, sitting right along the edge of a cliff. But that doesn't even compare to the inventor's cabin. It's perched off of an outer cliff and over the air, supported only by ropes and a few pieces of wood. There isn't even a way to walk into the structure. You have to jump over, which rightfully upsets the inventor. I firmly believed this thing would fall under my weight by the end of the game, but it didn't. We beg the inventor for a weapon, but he is so angry about our breaking and entering that all he gives us is a rock sling. The rock sling is an excellent weapon. Normally, if a game has a base infinite ammo weapon, it's a makeshift tool used for melee or the character just throws a punch. Not in Northern Journey though. The sling is a viable weapon in its own right, which is good because the max ammo of other weapons is pretty low. Since the sling fires rocks, ammo is unlimited. If there is no rock loaded when you pull out the sling, one will be, which is an animation in of itself. If a rock is already loaded when you put the weapon away, it will remain loaded when you pull it back out. So you can prepare early for a fight if you want to. You press the left mouse button to start swinging the sling. With every rotation, the attack is increased, achieving full damage at the third rotation. If you wait too long or cancel out of the rotations, the sling will be lowered and nothing will be fired. Your arm does get tired. If you fire a rock successfully, it goes into an arc with the landing point expressed by your aiming reticle. It takes some getting used to, but getting one hit kills with it is extremely satisfying. Despite being more complicated than most FPS weapons, I found it impossible to dislike it just because of the satisfaction it brings when you get a clean kill. The distance of this thing is pretty nice too, and in the very early sections, you can snipe kill most enemies with a bit of patience. Great weapon, in both gameplay and design. Now we are armed, we can go forward to the lighthouse. We meet some woodsmen. They're hideous! and we are attacked by our first enemy. Now, I don't have arachnophobia, but there is something to be said about the movement pattern of spiders. Something about the way they walk that activates the avoid venomous animal instincts. And while a lot of games have spiders of various sizes, they rarely move in a realistic manner that activates the instinctual need to nope out. Even if they are animated correctly, general video game limitations such as speed requirements tend to ruin the effect. These spiders though, the ones in Northern Journey, are made with such detail that activates the nope instincts perfectly. The way the feet tippy tappy and the full body lunge at the player, it's great. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but there are also multiple variations of spider. For example, we have some classic Latrodectus-like spiders here on the rocks. But a bit further along, we have jumping spiders with the associated anatomy and animations. The attention to detail and realism really adds to these creatures, and I think future animators should take notes. That in mind, it's better if you just snipe the spiders from a distance. They, like most enemies in this game, are fast moving and can close a gap in seconds. So with our slow moving rock sling, it's better to kill them before they even know you're there. Now before some of y'all arachnophobes start demanding a spider replacement mod, know that spiders are everywhere in this game, from start to finish. 
It is literally the most common type of enemy. If you can't handle virtual spiders, then you are simply too chicken to play this game. If it helps any, I guarantee that the spiders won't come out of the screen at any point. Around the corner to the lighthouse and we meet an interesting fellow. He actually will foreshadow future sections of the game, but as his name suggests, there isn't really much reason to exhaust his dialogue. Animations are cool though, there's something to be said about getting high in a game this weird. Just remember to knock down the stairs that let you come back here from the opening pathway before the village. It'll save you some time later. We take an elevator down to a pier between the cliffs. There's something to be said about how these tiny elevators are an acrophobe's worst nightmare, but I believe the visuals speak for themselves. The lighthouse is on a small islet and does contain the key to the forest gate. It was left here by the sheriff, which is odd to say the least. We can also let down the lighthouse bridge so we can easily loop back to the village. I love the level design so far. Everything feels so connected. Before reaching the village, we meet a wolf. Simply named Wolf on Top, this is the wolf skin cloak of the flute player. Add that to the suspicious pile. The good boyo has a letter from the flute player telling us to talk to the village idiot. The idiot will recount his travels across the land. He found three treasures on his journey. One made a red door on the ice, behind which he found the demon worm. One he lost in a misty forest and is wrapped in his pants. The last was wrapped in a sock and was lost here in the village. Oh, and uh, the snake ate the sheriff's dog. Anyway, grab some healing and then head out into the forest. Be careful of the small rock elementals that will sneak up behind you. The forest path area very quickly comes off as a horror fairy tale sort of setting. Feels like the kind of place you get mauled by a talking bear in and have your bones harvested by a witch while fairies eat your flesh. Look, if you didn't know old folklore gets dark more often than not, you might be playing the wrong game. The flute player will tell you what's up. He'll give you a going ball thing that is totally not just the Zelda fairy. Hey! Whenever you murder something, the not fairy will absorb their soul. I mean, energy. After enough kills, the fairy will be able to open dark barriers that block your path. Basically, it's a mechanic to stop you from just running past everything to speedrun the game. Not Navi will also tell you if water is too deep to walk in. It's a nice feature, when it works. The water being tested tends to be far further ahead than where you are about to walk. But I didn't come across any actual problems from this. The flute player will also warn you about the black spy, a little goblin looking dude who will run around you as you walk through the forest. He can't be hurt or even hit, and hypothetically is supposed to keep out of your way. But in my playthrough he kept running in front of me and quickly became annoying. Time to go into the woods. The area is combat focused with many enemies but very little platforming or ways to get lost. That isn't to say there isn't any landmarks or things to discover, it's just the main focus here is killing enemies. In addition to the previously mentioned jumping spiders, ranged acid spitting giant beetles, water dwelling giant blood leeches, slow flying deer head, tree flavored rock elementals, and water bound long armed monsters will block your way. Although none of them have particularly complicated AI, they each have their own gimmicks and feel varied in design. Though you only have your sling right now, if you pace yourself and take advantage of the health potions, the area is relatively easy to get through. It's a good warm up. At some point in the forest, we'll meet up with the wolf again. The letter he holds this time reveals the nature of the treasures stolen from the flute player. The Dimensional Violators. Unfortunate translations aside, these tools open tunnels to any realm you focus on. Needless to say, these are very, very dangerous items. Speaking of, let's cover the collectibles, most of which come in the form of vials. Vials can be found in every map section of the game, and each give a different positive effect. The radioactive Gatorade is your standard health potion. They are used immediately and come in 10 and 25 health point variants. The game is very generous with them, but that doesn't mean you won't die occasionally. Next is the red vials. They are much smaller and often out of the way. Most often, they are hidden behind trees, near cliffs, or otherwise require some exploration. Each gives you a permanent health upgrade of one more health point. This might not seem like much, but if you stay reasonably vigilant, this will add up. If you collect enough, you get a prize, which is told to the player when they pick up the first vial. 
I love these, as they encourage the player to look around and explore beyond the obvious pathways. Then there are the purple vials. These are uncommon, but not particularly rare. They serve as a portable health kit. You collect them and can save them for later. These are a lifeline in a difficult battle, as the normal healing vials are often used up quickly. You have a very limited number of these, and they only give 15 health, so these are far from overpowered. Finally, there are the orange vials. These increase both your max ammo amounts and your max purple vials. The increase is small with the ammo and literally a fraction for the purple vials, but like the red vials, the amounts add up over time. There is only one of these per area of the game and are often very easy to miss. It is notable that the enemies, ammo pickups, and the vials don't respawn. Once enemy is dead, they stay dead. Once a vial is picked up, it stays used up. This creates a nice balance. The player will revisit many of the areas multiple times, so good players are organically rewarded with spare ammo and health, while poor players will get a steady increase in difficulty. I like it, and it is part of the brilliant level designed by the developer. Ravenfen is another combat zone, but rather than a linear corridor, it is mostly open. The trees and grass in the area are mostly dead, and red ferns give this place a prairie-like appearance. It's dreary with the light rain here, and rock slides carve out the boundary walls. The enemies here are mostly giant crane flies and rabid sheep that have gone mad from being infested with ticks. I mean, ticks suck, but how can they be so bad that the sheep would attack- OH GOD! FUCKING HELL, THOSE TICKS ARE THE SIZE OF SMALL DOGS! HOW THE FUCK ARE THESE SHEEP NOT EMPTY JUICE PACKETS BY NOW? I would go insane too if I had parasites this big. Damn! Our flute player is here too. He tells us of three grave mounds in the area. Inside is a bow, a key, and a shield respectively. The first mound is easy to miss and contains the eastern bow along with some arrows and health. Be careful, on the way out you'll be ambushed by skeletons. The eastern bow is a nice upgrade from the sling. It is much faster and hits at a consistently higher damage. For comparison, a tick-covered sheep usually takes at least two full power rock sling hits, but only one bow arrow. Keep in mind when you aim that the bow is off-center, which is a nice bit of realism even if it takes some adjustment from the player. There is also much less of an arc, so accuracy should be more on point. The big drawback to the bow is the limited ammo amount you start off with. When you first get the bow, you'll most likely max out at 5 to 7 arrows at once. Yeah, needless to say, you'll likely be minimizing its use for now until you raise that number or get more weapons. Thankfully, by the midway point of the game, you should have 20 or so max arrows, assuming you've been collecting the orange vials. By that point, it'll become a reliable mid-tier weapon. The second gravesite is a long tunnel. It probably seems clear at first, but many skeletons will spawn behind you as you go on. At the end is several skeleton spawning coffins and the Raven Watch Key. The key opens up the watchtower by the same name in the area. In the basement of the tower is a leech and some health, and at the top of the tower is a bird with a letter. It seems the flute player has a message raven, who I could only assume is like the wolf from before. The letter is ominous and warns that the church in Deadwell is built on top of something ancient, and that the name of Deadwell is more literal than we think. A bit random in timing, but interesting to sit on. The third grave mound is not a grave or a mound, but rather the shield we need is on a stone mount. The shield can't be used in battle and is for a quest. Despite the name of Twin Shield and our new objective of finding another shield, there is more than two shields to find. This is the only shield in Ravenfen though, so let's move on. Despite being a combat zone, there are some locals in the area, namely a band of traveling musicians. They are wet and miserable and seem to be trapped by some rocks blocking the road. These are the same rocks blocking our path, so we'll be helping the musicians by helping ourselves. A fourth side in the area is beyond a dark seal and is partially flooded. Skeletons and the local variant of leeches live here. Pull the demon tongue lever to cause a rock slide and open the path forward. Green Slit is unfortunately named, but it is a platform-focused hub area we will definitely return to. As the name suggests, it is a river-split crevice covered in green. There are many gaps and jumping platforms, as well as ropes and zip lines. It is easy to slip off the cliff edge, and once again I can't help but feel bad for those with a fear of heights. While you can go out of order and explore around for items we'll need later, we'll address only what we need to for now. 
The flute player meets us again to tell us what's up. We need a faster weapon, and one is right on the other side of the river. There is also a place we need to return the shields to to open a path, but we'll need more than the one we have. We can use the zip lines around the place once we find a pulley in a place called Knock Pond. Oh, and the tower is haunted, because of course it is. If I've learned one thing from this game so far, it's that Norwegians don't stay dead. The weapon mentioned is a hopping path away, and is easy for anyone not an acrophobe. Before we leave though, we should explore until we find these small poles in the wall. Hop across to find the crank for the elevator in Deadwell outside the woodsman's cabin. After we grab the weapon and crank, we should go down the nearest path from where the weapon was back to Deadwell. As the name suggests, the invertebrate's crossbow is meant to make killing bug enemies easier. There isn't a damage boost or anything, but it is a nice needler type of weapon. It can be loaded ahead of time and fires at an immediate speed. The reload time is also fast, but it is single shot. The max ammo starts at a relatively high number at around 20 to 24 depending. The drawback is that the damage is half that of the eastern bow. So while it is good for fast and low health enemies, the actual damage done stops it from being better than other weapons so far. Not a bad weapon overall though, and it's gotten me through a rough fight more than once. We loop back to Deadwell and end up on the cliffs not far from the seer. We return to town and are greeted with... The demon and worm have escaped and ran into the church, specifically past the Jesus painting. Even though the priest sees everything, he denies it. The sheriff is equally useless, but seems to still be naive to the nature of the demon. We put all of that aside for now and use the crank to lower the woodsman's elevator. It's quite a long way down, and with all the items scattered about, it isn't hard to tell what comes next. Boss battle time. We have to defeat the ghost of a witch. She isn't complicated, but she'll quickly corner you and fire off hard to avoid bolts of lightning. Keep in mind you have to reserve health and try to keep calm while aiming. In the arena is several throwing axes. It's also possible to have picked these up and green slit beforehand. The exhumed axes are ideal for tougher enemies such as bosses. They have a low starting number of about 5 to 8, but give far more damage than any other weapon you have so far. They are not affected by gravity, but have a relatively short distance. Again, great for tougher enemies, but probably best saved until then. After you defeat Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost, you find the Rope Wheel Key, which unlocks the back door of the mother and daughter's house. The mother isn't too friendly still, but the daughter has run off somewhere. The back door leads to a cliffside, and on the other side of a particularly long bridge is the daughter. Yo. Come to me, I'll show you where to go. Okay. Oh, whoa, 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 wait, wait. You're a bitch. Let's try that again. You can't kill her ahead of time, but if you avoid her, she yeets herself off the bridge on her own. Funny enough, while editing my blind let's play of the game, I noticed she had a tail which we'll see on some other characters in the future. What was she guarding? Apparently a freight elevator. Take it down to the cliffs not far from the starting pier and grab the shield before hopping back onto the starting shore. I legit love the loopy map structure. Masterful level design. Heading back up the hill to Deadwell, we are stopped by a familiar face on an unfamiliar body. The mother wants revenge and has taken on a serpent form to do so. You are locked into a section of road while she flies around on her broom shooting acid at you. If you can aim well, you can get some good damage in with the bow, but you are likely low on ammo after the ghost fight. If you are close enough to the end of her attack phase, she'll do a low to the ground rush attack. Feel free to go back down towards the coast a bit to get her lower to try this. Try to get some axe hits in while she does this. Remember to keep track of your footing in case you slip off the cliff into the river. She's a rough fight, mainly from how hard it is to get a hit in. 
but staying alive isn't too difficult. Once defeated, she'll fly away, swearing that she'll be waiting for you in Sourwood. Let's go ahead and head on back to Green Slit. We are free to explore without too much of an objective that needs focusing in on. There are a few shields in the area to collect, a place called the Troll Hole, and a dead corpse in a caved-in tunnel you need to loot a broken lantern off of. Unfortunately, we need a lantern to enter the Troll Hole, and the lantern we have now needs parts from a second lantern to be fixed. That's as good as an objective as any. Up on the higher sections of the available area, there are giant horse flies and a giant ant mound that will spit out a large but not infinite number of forest ants, which is great for testing out your new crossbow. Up in the middle sections is a carved out crevice filled with giant tailless moss scorpions. These guys use their pincers to pick up rocks to chuck at you, but they are relatively easy to dodge. In the back of the crevices is a small carved out room with a second lantern. Now that we have a completed light source, it might be tempting to sprint back to the troll hole, but we are going to explore this out of the way section a bit longer. On the other side of the crevices is a small pond too deep to walk across. In the center is a green woman on a metal raft. The fact she is green would normally scare one away, but this game has perfectly friendly and human characters who look like this. So, we might as well trust this green lady. And, uh, there she goes. Well, that was surprisingly pleasant. I honestly should have seen it coming with her name being the Grandmother in Reverse and all. Moving on, let's go check out the Troll Hole. It should be noted that on the Steam page, this area is widely hated. But honestly, it might be one of my favorite sections of the first half of the game. There is a lot of unique challenges in this area, and while some are major difficulty spikes, each area is a ton of fun. In other words, don't change a thing, Dev. The challenge of this area ramps up immediately with our first enemy of the dungeon, the Summoner. While we travel through these caverns, we find the notes of an explorer who came before us. In the first note, he warns us about the Summoner and the trick to defeating them. The Summoner is a small green troll who summons minions to attack you. The trolls spawn very greatly, from sprouting heads that spawn under the player to attack, mushrooms that shield the summoner from attacks, little crawling grubs, and unfortunate levels of phallic flying mushrooms. These are a massive pain to deal with, but the trick was told to us in the note we found. If we kill the summoner, the troll spawn will not die, but they will no longer spawn in. So, no matter what he throws at you, focus your efforts on the summoner himself. Ideally, you should try to kill him before he summons the protective mushrooms, as those are the biggest slowdown. You'll probably be happy to hear that this little bastard and his bell are not normal enemies and don't appear often in this game. After you defeat the summoner, cross the pond. Don't worry about the bats, as they aren't even hittable. Once you cross to the other side, you'll find a new note. Up ahead are rock elementals, and you can only damage them with more rocks. In other words, you are limited to your sling in the next fight. These aren't the little guys from back up the forest path either. These three elementals are large and have a lot of health, and will slowly advance towards you while hurling several rocks at once. Think the moss scorpions, but turned up to 11. If they get close enough, they'll hit you with their impressive reach, so try to keep a bit of space. At first, it might be tempting to funnel them down the tunnel towards the water, but there isn't quite enough room for you to kill them before they reach you. There is also little room to dodge in the tunnel, but there are a couple side crevices you can hide from damage for a bit. However, the elementals approach quickly, and the safe space won't be safe for long. My advice is to charge forwards and around the elementals into the big room at the end of the tunnel. There is a lot of health in this room and way more room to dodge. It's difficult, but eventually the elementals will shatter from your sling and open up the way forward. 
Up next is the Guardian. We never see the Guardian, just a mass of giant tentacles sprouting out of the water. These cannot be killed, and right now attacking it is a waste of time. You need to sprint away from them, around or over deep waters, and make sure they don't grab you as that is an instant game over. In the second cavern is a bag of bait. Lure the arms away while quickly moving across the stepping stones to the other side. The moment the bait ball is used up, the tentacles will zoom over to you so either spam the bait or sprint like mad. While many have called this section too difficult, I had few problems with it, and I saw other players beat it on their first try. It seems that in an earlier version of the game, there was a summoner in the next tunnel, but when I played, there was instead a note telling the player a tip on how to handle the next enemy. Either way, try to save your game while you can. The next cavern is quite large and filled with a shit ton of cave spiders. These thin-legged boys don't have any gameplay gimmicks and don't lunge at you or anything like that. There are just a lot of them, and you are best taking the advice of the note and luring them over to your side of the room a few at a time. Before you leave, don't forget to pick up the Shedding Swords. We'll talk about those after we finish up the troll hole. Hop over the river cliff and climb down the rope into the hole. Climb down along the side of a rather nice waterfall and duck into a small tunnel branching off the main one. Inside is the skeletal remains of our poor note-taker. He says that rapid fire from a weapon can temporarily fend off the arms of the Guardian, and that he is tired and needs to rest. Next to him is the rotating crossbow. Like the swords, we'll address this weapon in detail after we complete the dungeon. For now, know that this rapid fires faster than any other weapon, but for very weak damage. Another flooded cavern awaits, and our old friend the Guardian is waiting for us. With a rotating crossbow though, he becomes relatively trivial. Just make sure to fire until the tentacle goes underwater entirely and move quickly before it returns. One final note, there is a large troll ahead in the, wait for it, hole. A troll hole, if you will. Anyway, time for an end of dungeon boss battle. There is a large troll with a massive moose head on the end of a chain, which it uses as a flail. There is one final summoner in here as well. The summoner is by far the hardest part of this battle, so try to kill him immediately upon entering the arena so you can knock him out of the fight before he can throw out protective shrooms. Once the summoner is dead, the large troll becomes trivial. Simply keep your distance and wail on him. He'll drop after a while, opening up the tunnel forward. Make your way up until you see the minecart track. As you can immediately guess, once you walk up the track only a little, a few minecarts will ride down. You can dodge to the sides, but some have angry miners riding them, who will impale you with their pickaxes as they pass. What a bunch of assholes! Exit out into Green Slit. You're up on a new ledge, and the wolf is waiting with the letter for you. It reminds you that you need the shields to progress, and once you place them, the original owners will be summoned. Good advice. Before moving on, let's check out our new weapons. First, the Shedding Swords. Despite being swords, these are ranged weapons. The idea is that these swords release parts of themselves to cut into the afterlife. The damage is greater than the axe, but the actual gameplay is almost identical. They even throw the same way. Normally, having clone weapons would be a bad thing, but with the max ammo being so low, having a slightly stronger clone of your other best weapon so far is not necessarily a bad thing. Still, I couldn't help but think of it as another set of axes. The rotating crossbow is definitely a fun weapon for a medieval setting. It's the fastest weapon so far, but also the weakest. Though still not as fast as a modern weapon, its speed makes it a nice needler weapon, even more so than the invertebrate crossbow. It definitely has its uses, but the low damage means the invertebrate crossbow and arrows are still better used for most situations. It's better saved for swarms or hard to hit enemies. If you've been exploring around a reasonable amount, including places like the top of the Haunted Tower, then you should have all the shields by now. Take them to a small cave guarded by an angry moose. You're gonna wanna take care of the moose first. Place the shields and meet them outside with your bow for a boss battle. You need to use your bow to hit them around their shields. If you keep a reasonable distance, you should be fine. There are plenty of arrows around and you've had more than enough target practice by now. And of course, you could disrespect the dead and use a different weapon if you really want. Once defeated, the ghost will open the path forward to Knock Pond. Knock Pond is simultaneously beautiful and sinister. 
but that can be said about most things in this game. Make sure to talk to the flute player first thing on entering, as this place has a gimmick. In the lake is the Knock-In. It is unkillable and immune to damage. This creature will follow the player from the deep waters, singing a song that pulls the player towards them. The range of the song is quite wide, so the entire rim of the lake is not safe. As you get closer to the Knock-In, the pull gets stronger until you can't fight it anymore and are pulled into the deep water to drown. Naturally, most of the ammo, health, and upgrades in the area are near the shore. Thankfully, the Knock-In moves slower than the player, and at full sprint, the player can keep a healthy distance. You also can't save while being pulled even a little, so be careful of that. We can only access one side of the pond for now, as we need the pulley to reach the other. Following along the rim, be careful of blood-sucking mosquitoes and difficult-to-hit dragonflies. There are a couple of paths branching from the pond. One of these paths is a flood strip. The water is shallow, but plenty of giant bugs are concentrated here. At the end of the strip is a small cave filled with wood lice that hide up the walls and drop down on the player as they pass. At the end, a wizard-looking man, probably a lone miner or woodsman, is dead with a key in his hand. This key is for a small wooden cabin off another one of the pond trails guarded by two moose. We'll come back to that later though. First, we need to go down this other path. Past this rope is a small path into a- God damn it. This is the snake pit, and as the name implies, this little area is filled with snakes. While it is tempting to run around, you should instead move very slowly and kill the snakes one by one without alerting the others. Once you murder them all, which is terrible because look how cute they are, you can easily retrieve the rope pulley. This opens up so much of the game. Using the pulley is as simple as walking under a pulley rope and pressing E for a cutscene. The view is usually very interesting and you don't have to worry about combat while ziplining. The game will tell you if the rope is one way or not and where it goes, most of the time. Going back to the wooden cabin, we can now pass through the zipline rope. This rope will take us to the other side of the lake. This, plus the shortcut rope, really helps with traveling around the area. Zip across to the other side, which is primarily floodplains. In addition to the enemies mentioned previously in this area, there are a couple of bears and a new species of spider in these floodplains. The bears are tanks and have a lot of health and damage. The spiders are much worse though. These giant raft spiders work like boos or weeping angels. They don't move if you stare at them, but the moment you look away, they are right up on you. To make it worse, they often go under the shallow waters or otherwise camouflage into the foliage. There's quite a lot of them, so expect some surprise attacks. There are three big things to get in these floodplains. First is the goat lever in this small cave. It is the first half of our new weapon. The other is the crossbow itself, which is perched precariously on this ledge. The further out on the ledge you go, the closer you get to the knock-in in their pool. You need to sprint across, and be careful not to fall or take too long. Once you have both pieces, you can use the bear crossbow. We'll go into detail about that in a bit. The last thing we need in this area is to find this frog statue. Underneath is a tunnel to Sourwood, but it seems the magic statue guarding the path has been vandalized. Two wooden eyes are needed to open the way. Dejected, we leave, but are met with the wolf on top with a new letter. We need to find a flask filled with the strength of nine men, and we are pointed towards Greenslit. The bear crossbow is our strongest weapon so far. It deals a massive amount of damage and has a range comparable to a sniper rifle. The drawback is not only an extremely low ammo amount, but also an ungodly slow reload time. My god, are you counting the seconds when you're reloading this thing mid-fight? In other words, this weapon is basically the opposite of the rotating crossbow, and is best kept for boss fights and long-distance shots. Up on top of the haunted tower in green slit is a roped ballista. Fire at the distant red mark to set up a zipline we can use to reach the far mountain. Up on top is the trilobite key. Then, head back and over to the old fort. The fort was briefly controlled by bandits who all died. Sometime later, a necromancer resurrected the entire crew who now guard the old fort forever. Let's help them retire. I'm not gonna lie, this was an incredibly difficult fight. First, before you approach the bridge, take out the snipers on the towers. You are meant to use the bear crossbow, but lighter weapons can be used. All the while, there will be flaming stones launched at you. These stones stop with the death of the snipers. When you approach the bridge, you will be fenced into the grass in a way too small arena. And... Oh shit! 
A massive swarm of undead, armed with spears and crossbows, sweep in on you. Keep your distance and try your best not to miss. The sheer number of enemies means running out of all ammo is a very real possibility. It may take a few tries, but once the entire swarm is dead, you can storm the fort. Once wiped of enemies, make your way up to the store. This Sleipnir door is pretty kick-ass, I have to admit. Hopefully you picked up the key like I told you to. If the entrance door wasn't cool enough, the fossil-riddled caves of the tomb create an H.R. Giger-esque texture. This area is relatively short, but really cool aesthetically. There are several stone coffins about, and one can't help but wonder if there are Skyrim-style draugers around every corner. It doesn't help you probably have no ammo from the last battle. We find a web-covered chamber housing the local flavor of spider. These cave spiders hang out on the sides of the walls, and when the player gets too close, they shoot themselves out to try and grab the player. They are vulnerable as they return to their original spot, so take advantage of this to clear the room. Pull the skull lever to prime up the platform, and pull the chain to ride the elevator down. This room is rather suspicious. There is a valve connected from nine coffins to a vial. Activate the valve to fill the vial. Don't panic, they won't attack. We now have a potion that will temporarily give us enhanced strength. The next area is Fall Crush, and the name definitely invokes specific imagery. Maybe a large monster that crushes their foe, or a horribly steep cliff above jagged rocks. But no. This area has no enemies, and the platforming is extremely simple. Just follow the path up the mountainside and take a nice deep breath. This is a breather. A pleasant break in the hostility of the setting. A sigh of relief between challenges. Just take this section at your own pace. Just take in the scenery and relax. We have to do something about the priest. According to the flute player, the village idiot lost one of the dimensional violators in Deadwell, where it was discovered by the priest. Being a man of Christ, he naturally had what was probably hell on his mind, and accidentally opened a portal to there. A monster came through and replaced the priest with his doppelganger. The husk of the priest lies under the church, trapped by the heavy rock. So, we head back to Deadwell. We drink the strength elixir and remove the rock. We are trapped in the churchyard as the husk of the former priest attacks us. He isn't very smart and is just mindlessly charging at you. However, he has a large amount of health. Once defeated, you can go under the church and collect the bell tower key. If you talk to the priest during this time, he will be angry but won't drop his disguise or attack you. You can now go past the zombie Jesus painting, but not into the back room where the portal to hell likely is. We can head up into the bell tower though. Look up to see the eye up in the church bell. Ring it with a well-aimed rock. And collect the first eye. The priest gets mad and calls you a pagan if you talk to him. He still won't reveal himself though. Well, our good wolf puppers is here to help. A letter from the flute player tells us of a note sheet and a bottle thrown into Knock Pond by the priest. We need that music. And there is only one way to get to the bottom of Knock Pond alive. We visit the inventor. We ask the inventor to help us. He agrees, but only because he hopes you'll die in your quest. Let's head on over to Knock Pond. Thank you for the teleport, Mr. Dev. There's a diving bell of sorts here. The inventor has fixed it up for us and is willing to launch us into the water with a trebuchet.
With the diving bell, we can go all the way down, down, down into the dark depths of Knock Pond. We have no weapons except a flash of light that can very briefly stun creatures. There is a pressure gauge, but it is for cinematic purposes, so don't worry about it too much. For now. In the depths below, we are swarmed by the dead and are occasionally harassed by the knock. I'm going to take a few points off for the design of the knock. An octopus is unexpected, but I feel a more traditional humanoid or equine design would have been scarier. I guess the souls of the damned was to split the difference. While the gameplay of this section isn't the funnest, this is a section unique even by the standards of this game. I will say I had more fear over the lack of saves than the actual horror elements though. We travel deeper and deeper, so deep in fact that the pressure starts to crack the glass of the bell. At last we find the note, caught among the skeletal corpses trapped beneath the lake. We inflate the floating bag and just barely escape the knock close behind us. Now that we have the music sheet, we need someone to play it. Apparently calling on our fluter friend isn't an option, but luckily we know a few others who can play music. We head back to Ravenfen to recruit the traveling musicians who are more than happy to hold a concert. We time skip to that night. Oh wow, canonically everything we've done so far has taken place in a single day. Our poor character dude, hope he finds some time to rest after this. But first, it's time to party! We are in the forest outside of Deadwell, and the whole town is here. Now is a good time to get a good view of everyone if you haven't already. The priest emerges from the shadows and is creepy as hell as he approaches us. God, you're just like something out of a horror movie. Look at you. He plays dumb one last time before the musicians begin playing our song. Now, this song is holy and forces demons to reveal themselves. What kind of music do you think it is? Heavenly choirs? Gentle harps? Smooth jazz? That was amazing, and nice of the demon for him to give us the last eye. We bask in our victory as we fade to black. Woo! What a great way to celebrate the midpoint of the game. That's right, we're only halfway through, baby! Let's all go to the lobby and grab ourselves a drink because it's time to head north. We fade back in at Knock Pond. It seems the village idiot has stolen the dimensional violator from the church in hopes of getting his worm back. No one knows where he hid it, but there is another one towards the direction of Sourwood. The priest demon has run off towards it in hopes of going home, and we should follow him to find it ourselves. Go back to the eyeless statue under the frog, return the eyes, and open the bridge to Sourwood. Sourwood itself is surprisingly smoggy, 
The thick air is from the nearby mountains, and polluted aquifers are slowly destroying the landscape. This makes it appealing to the local witches, most of whom reside in these woods. Oddly enough, there are no enemies in the immediate area. Don't be fooled, though. My least favorite enemy of this game is coming up soon. According to the flute player, a witch is waiting for us in the maze pond, but we'll need three torment screws to get there. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but I learned a long time ago to stop questioning this game. We travel a while ahead before we see it. The Ticks. My absolutely most hated enemy of this game, and probably most others. They start out in one of two states. Eggs on the ground, or adults in the trees. If you get too close to an egg, it hatches a full-grown adult. If you get near a tree, they drop down on you. Either way, they'll race towards you, and if they get close enough, they'll latch on. They'll drink your blood until they are engorged, taking large amounts of health while at it. After they have their fill, they'll move away and then shit out several eggs into the air. Like normal eggs, they'll hatch out grown adults if you're at all close. You can't kill an engorged tick until at least one egg is laid. Between the fast hatch rate, the stealth attacks, the rapidly increasing swarm, and how easy it is to get locked into a blood drinking loop, these enemies are the worst to deal with in my opinion. I dreaded these little fuckers, and it slowed my pace to a crawl as I desperately made sure to snipe as many ticks as I could before they could attack. It's awful, but I will admit, it definitely fits the witch's wood setting. The other common enemy of this area is a swarm of daddy longlegs, and compared to the ticks, these guys are downright lovable. I mean, look at their little dance! Look at them not drinking my blood milliseconds after being born! We scour the woods for torment screws, visiting several small landmarks along the way. Naturally, we are being watched by the witches. Shake these bones to summon the snake mother from before. You don't fight her directly here, though, but rather a swarm of her witchlings, these hag-faced snakes. They spit goo like the witch, but go down with a few hits each. They are similar to other swarm boss fights. Take care of them and rattle the bones again. This time several rocks will fall from the cliffs, giving you a way forward. Danog Retom is here too. This time she makes no attempt to hide her true form, and even takes joy in messing with us. Watch my water bomb! Did, did a demonic witch just show us her cannonball jump? Don't worry about her for now. We gather all the torment screws, which look like giant corkscrews, and take them to this statue. Now, how do we use these to... Oh! Oh no! Oh! Take the elevator down into the accurately named Maze Pond. Hope you have a good sense of direction. There are thin wooden planks set up above the water. With our hero unable to swim, we must make our way through the maze of bridges without falling into the water. It is definitely easier said than done. Before we get too far into the maze though, we have to take care of the Snake Mother Witch. She is back on her broom, and like before, she will spit acid at us while zooming around. With very little mobility on the bridges, we are far more likely to die from a misstep than the witch's direct hits. To make everything so much worse, normal weapons do pretty much nothing to her. Thankfully, we are given the Sacrificial Staff, the first of multiple situational weapons. This staff is powered by sheep heads that are directly impaled onto the end to power bolts of magic. With every use, the head starts to decay until it is used up. There are more heads along the bridges. The ammo is counted as the number of shots you have rather than the number of heads, which is the case for future staffs as well. Despite the reticle being large, the actual beam of damage is only the very center, so keep that in mind while aiming. While the staff seems to make the fight more complicated, I appreciate the novelty and how it explains our sudden ability to kill previously unkillable beings. It also helps that this is metal as fuck. Sadly, we do lose the staff at the end of the fight. One murdered witch later, and we regain the best ability of them all! The power to save the game. The bridges are a pain to traverse, and thankfully you can save whenever you get close to the water. It takes a hot minute to figure out where to go, and the home stretch is more than a little satisfactory. At the end is... more witches. This is Delic Denarg, or Grandchild backwards. To be honest, I'm surprised the grandmother can have kids given the... 
questionable appearance of her lower region. Dev, my dude, please don't model any more genitals until you get a bit better. I'll start to worry if you model something this confusing again. To be frank, it looks like you took one of her tits, scaled it up a little, and then stuck it where a loincloth would be. Oh god, is it a loincloth? Anyway, taking after the mother, the child ferries us across the water. She warns us that the grandmother will open a dimensional violator to the realm of Mare, as in Nightmare. Sounds lovely. The child takes us to Dark Throat with surprisingly no incident. Here, the grandmother is waiting for us. Immediately to our right is a massive whirlpool, and it's clear we are meant to enter it somehow. We have to resist the call of the void, though. Wolf on top is here with a letter. It says we need an air supply before diving in, specifically an air tank and a mouthpiece. Seems easy enough. It's not like this is a vaguely medieval setting or anything. Moving through Dark Throat is not particularly difficult. The stepping stones are forgiving, and the enemies, some giant earthworms, are easy to kill before getting close. Just be sure to have a moment before leaping over long spaces. Find the two pieces of diving gear on the nearby rocks and head down to the waters. The bridge gives a good view of your impending doom. At these statues, you'll be prompted to put on your air supply. We awake in a lower cavern, miraculously alive. I love how the water droplets from the whirlpool are depicted here. Most games forget the finer details like that. We find a message in a bottle holding a letter from you-know-who. It instructs us on how to make a magical weapon. We need a branch and a bone which we will fasten together with nails from the bottle. We then had to, quote, go fishing. The branch and bone are both in the next room. It's weird how easy this level has been so far. We even get to channel our inner Tarzan and swing across a chasm on an old hanging rope. Though I will admit that view while falling was fun. We come across an old well. The point of a well in a cave is beyond me, but we attach our bone branch and go fishing down the well. We fish up... Aww, so cute! This is the worm staff. It is a situational weapon and has an interesting gimmick. When we use the weapon, one of the snake heads will shoot out while the other bites us. If we hit something, the health taken from that enemy transfers to us. If we miss, we instead lose health. It's interesting considering how bad accuracy in general is in this game. We need the staff to kill the grandmother. Her fight is... a bit weird. You have to stay up on her in order to strike her with the staff. Unfortunately, she's also a fast-moving melee fighter. Every few hits, she will turn into earthworms that have to be taken taken care of before she returns to her normal form. Keep a cool head and don't spam the worm staff and the battle is relatively easy. Once she is defeated, we can journey onward to Merbog. Wow, this level was surprisingly short and easy. That isn't an insult per se, as the level was still very interesting, but it was notably easier than Sourwood. Merbog is a gimmick level, but also an interesting change of pace. At first, there are no enemies in Merbog. There is only a wooden cabin and a pair of lost pants. There is a dimensional violator here, but to find it we need to do something first. Up on these rocks is the messenger raven. The letter warns that the cabin is a trap, and the stone the raven carries will protect you. Well, let's put that to the test. Grab the key, open the cabin, and take a much-deserved nap. Sweet dreams.
We try to follow it, but quickly it is us who is being chased. Quickly head through the bog as the dimensional violator is somewhere close. All the while the mare will harass you. Your only weapon is the protective stone, which will stun and throw back the mare, but not for long. The mare's attacks will become more frequent over time, so it's definitely better to move fast than slow. Torches will usually guide you forward. At the end of the path will be the dimensional violator. I have to admit, it was reassuring to finally see one, considering how much trouble we We've gone through without actually catching up to any of them. Unfortunately, we can't close the portal to the mare dimension until the mare creature is back through it. We use the stone to angle the mare and knock it back into the portal, giving us time to close it. Damn, that was awesome! Woo! We did it! We got our first dimensional violator. And that was definitely a sentence I didn't think I would ever say. It's not time to head home yet, though. We still need to follow the doppelganger up into the mountains. Onwards to Granite Gash. At first, Granite Gash looks like it would be similar to Fall Crush. But while the scenery is pleasant, this section is long and filled with multiple difficult battles. Before venturing too far, make sure to unlock the shortcut to Sourwood. Apparently, this suspension bridge crosses the entirety of Marebog all the way to Sourwood. Look, you can even see it above you in the bog. There is just so much nice detail in this game. I love it. Back to Granite Gash, we need to head up the mountains to a glacier. Following the theme of a pleasant environment, the first enemies of the area are giant bumblebees and some of these mountain rapids are weird goo monsters. They go down easy enough, but they spit out giant wood lice which rush the player before exploding. A little further along are some giant water skimmers. And in a shocking turn of events, these little guys won't attack the player. They just want to do their own little thing. That's weirdly wholesome for this game. Either way, we go along until we reach this tower in the center of the pond. We head down underground to see this... Dream? Huh. That's right, we need to sprint from this tunnel as it floods from the drain. There is a few dead ends, so watch yourself. Heading further up, we launch ourselves out of a catapult because ladders are for pussies. The blood on the walls are a nice touch. As we head up the stairs, be careful of the sea serpents. River serpents? Aquatic bitey noodle boys. At the top of these falls is the den of the troll spiders. Oh look, a red vial. You can collect some ammo here, including a new weapon, the throwing spears, which we'll get to in a bit. However, you have to move fast as the creatures in the water approach rapidly. Your only escape is the elevator down. Well, more accurately, it is a serving cage. That's a dinner bell. The troll spider's boss battle is a bit rough if you don't know what you're doing. You have to fight two large male spiders, a massive female spider, and a swarm of spiderlings. The spiders are usually very aggressive, pushing forward onto the player with great speed. Every once in a while, all the spiders will retreat, with the babies returning to their mother and the adults going up on the ceiling. During this time, the males would try to sneak above the player to get behind them. Then, they'll all return to aggressively attacking the player. My recommended strategy is to focus on them in order of size, and try your best to focus on a single spider at a time. When they are putting pressure on the player, focus on knocking out as many spiderlings as possible. Once they retreat, pick your favorite male and focus on him. Try to avoid switching which male you focus in on, and just try to knock at least one out as soon as possible. When the spiderlings drop, focus in on them again. As far as I can tell, the spiderlings don't reach spawn, and you'll likely knock out both males before finishing them off anyway. With everyone else gone, lay into the queen. The newly acquired throwing spears do nice amounts of damage, and with all the other spiders out of the way, you should have plenty of room to aim. If you let loose all your good weapons, she'll go down relatively quickly. Grab any remaining supplies and the mountain key and get out of there. We still have a lot of work to do. 
At the mouth of the cave, we are greeted by the wolf on top. The letter warns us that trolls have set up catapults ahead. As the game suggests, using the bear crossbow is your best bet against them, but I would still recommend moving slowly so you can dodge their explosive cannonballs. There is very few places to duck for cover, so active dodging is required. There are quite a few trolls too, and this section took me a while. While we make our way through that mess, let's talk about our new weapon, the Throwing Spear. It's slow, hard to aim, is one of two weapons with the lowest amount of max ammo, and has a heavy arc with barely any distance. As awful as this is, it makes up for it in damage, dealing far more than even the bear crossbow, making it invaluable for boss battles. It has its place, but unfortunately it's not here against these trolls. Getting through this valley is a pain, but there are even more trolls on the next mountain. It is not until we reach the very top of the waterfall that we are rid of them. However, the challenge ahead is much worse. We need to cross some meadow wetlands, but a magical cult had once set up shop here. They had used their magic to splice trolls and spiders together, and the result were these awful things. More importantly though, the flute player promises us something. I promise it is the last living and air-breathing spiders you may meet in this world. Remember that. Etch it into your minds, because it is true, and we will hold the game to this promise. With the promise in our minds, we fight these awful things. The trolls will rush us, spawning house spiders out of their hands. They will do this continuously until you have the max number of spiders attacking you. Each troll takes quite a bit of damage to kill, and when they die, they turn into yet another spider. There are quite a number of trolls and quite a number of max spiders. So the inevitable result is a clusterfuck of you trying to keep your distance while slowly lowering the number of the massive spider horde after you. Just focus on the trolls first before even considering attacking the spiders. By the time the deed is done, you are thankful for the game's previous promise. Take a deep breath and take the elevator to the aqueduct, leading up into the frozen mountaintops. The hypothermia waste really hammers in the game's name of Northern Journey, and so will the next few environments. We head up to the top of a towering ramp where the flute player will explain what to do next. The glider is entirely controlled by looking around with the mouse. Look down to drop in height but increase speed dramatically, and look up to go that direction at the cost of speed. The speed is gained quicker than lost, so there isn't much threat of losing too much momentum once you know what you're doing. The hardest part is landing. Using the mouse, you need to steer into these nets. You can be going any speed, but you can't hit the pillars or anything else at an angle. To land, you must hit the middle of these nets head on and straight forward. Now that I've told you what to do, you probably wouldn't have much trouble. Finding this out through trial and error with no saving is where the difficulty came from. You're welcome. Like previous gimmick levels, this one isn't that long. As much as the trial and error frustrated me, I overall enjoyed this segment, if anything because it was another change of pace. To get to the next area though, you must cross the most painful to cross bridge in video game history. Just look at this thing! The winds blow the suspension bridge side to side and the player must actively turn to follow it. You can't save either, so keep a careful eye on it as it moves. You probably thought the bridge wasn't too bad because the end of the level was right there. Well, you enter the next area, the Haunted Glacier, on the same bridge, only now it's dark, and you can't see for more than a few feet in front of your face. Just to taunt you a little, the bridge even gets alarmingly close to smacking into the side of an ice wall. Thankfully, the bridge is short on this side as well. Sweet, sweet, solid ground! We are introduced to the gimmick of the area. There are several locked gates around the glacier with flutes nearby. We need to find statues of flute players to hear their songs. Thankfully for tone-deaf people like me, we are also given numbers to mark the different notes. Using the flutes near the doors, we play back the song code by looking up or down to play different notes. It can definitely be a little wonky at times, but putting the flute down can reset an odd note placement. Just past the first of these doors is a small fort. Remember to be polite and knock before entering. Oh god damn it. As always, the flute player tells us what's up. The haunted glacier has two types of ghosts. The native ghosts are black shadows similar to the black spy from the forest path. They cannot be hit and we need to avoid them. The white ghosts were summoned by the doppelganger and need to be fought like normal enemies. 
There are subtypes of each set of ghosts, but they aren't mentioned here, so we'll cover them as they appear. For now, let's leave our lazy employer to his comfort while we freeze to death on this icy hellscape. The first ghosts we'll encounter are these little shadow imps with horns. Despite their eyes flashing red, they never attack you. They seem to just be curious to what you are doing in their home. Fair enough. By the end, you'll have a small collection of them, which I will admit becomes distracting at times. The other shadow ghosts, like these humanoid ones, will attack and damage you. You don't have much choice but to avoid them, but with you most likely focusing on a more active threat, this is easier said than done. The white ghosts come in two major forms. These sheet ghosts who attack at a normal rate, and these skeletons who attack rapidly and drain your health in seconds. Both come in massive swarms and are loud as hell. They'll follow you if you try to run back or past them, but you can still use the terrain to your advantage to buy extra breathing room. I got past this particular spot by hopping between cliffs to funnel the ghosts into more manageable numbers. One of the set pieces I really like is this ice bridge. Apparently, it's a major roadway for the local ghost, and you basically have to find a spot to move along and avoid traffic. None of the ghosts care to attack you or avoid you. They're just going about their day with no care for you. It just happens to hurt when they touch you. We eventually come across this pond with a water monster in it. We can't damage the shadow creature directly, so we need to find another way to remove it. Well, if we head under this tunnel, we'll find another stop plug like this one we saw before. This one is made of ice though. One good hit and the creature is beached where we can safely move around him. What? I was promised no more spiders! Oh, These spiders are not living, or even spiders for that matter, so they don't count. Damn it. They are harder to kill than a normal spider too. Finally, we reach some zip lines leading to the doppelganger and his boss fight. Wolf's letter tells us to use the Thunder Stabs, the situational weapon for this fight, which we can find around the arena. No other weapons hurt the doppelganger or the ghosts he summons. The letter also tells you to keep your distance and snipe. Now, the advice so far in this game has been spot on, but this is the exception. You're gonna wanna stay middle close to him during the fight. Otherwise, the ghost will constantly get in your way. You'll also need to run around the arena in general to collect more stabs and health, as you'll lose at least one of those things to the ghosts. This fight is definitely a difficulty jump compared to the previous ones, but this late into the game, it's welcomed. Finally, after defeating him, he'll return to the portal and we can close the gate and retrieve the Dimensional Violator. We take an ice slide back down. And that flute playing bastard is still nice and toasty next to the fire. Ironically, using the dimensional violator, the flute player sends us back to Deadwell to retrieve the final device. It's here that you're gonna wanna make sure you've collected everything. We are about to enter the final sections of the game, so any unfinished business needs to be completed now. Once you are ready to go, meet the flute player outside the church. Apparently a portal to the world the pet worm was from is open in the back of the church, and the village idiot has gone there to get his pet back. The flute player has already arranged some diving equipment for us, which is a red flag if there ever was one. At least we have flippers this time. We open the door to the back of the church. Whatever was banging on the door the whole game isn't here apparently. Oh well. The door leads to an underground tunnel. There is a statue of someone praying. Three books around are Bibles that only read out holy words. One book, however, is demonic and causes the statue to fall. Behind the statue is the way to the drowned veins. This area is extremely dark, save for a cone of light you can see by. This place is tinted green and blue, creating a very unique appearance just short of trippy. That doesn't help much if you can barely see a foot ahead of you. It's time to dive into the waterways, but make sure to put on the diving gear first. It's a good thing our character suddenly knows how to swim now. Our limited view, now in an underwater setting, is suspenseful and claustrophobic. It feels like any second now, a creature with large teeth will come at us from the depths. It doesn't help that there are multiple skeletal remains of large monsters. Thankfully, red ropes guide our general path forward at any given time. There are no enemies at first, until we reach these beautiful stained glass windows. 
Break them all. Behind them will be the harpoon gun. You'll need these for the water beetles. These guys are all packed in the already tight waterways and will quickly rush the player. Thankfully, a reasonable aim and a steady pace will make them trivial compared to previous enemies. There are also sea spiders in this area. What? More spiders? But the promise! Well, sea spiders are neither spiders nor air breathing, so... The spiders themselves are basic, but you are likely to run out of harpoons at some point, so be selective on what you kill. While the diving parts are neat, I feel this level's a bit long and uneventful for this late in the game. I enjoyed it, don't get me wrong, but it would serve better as a normal change of pace level rather than the area leading up to the final story beats. At the end of the level is a bunch of horrific mermaid goblin statues in this small room. If you have collected enough red vials up until this point, you get to unlock these bars and receive the best normal weapon of the game, the Ballista. This baby does the most damage in the game, but at the cost of two reloading animations both before and after firing, and having the smallest max ammo amount. There is also a notable pushback when firing, so keep that in mind while lining up a shot. This baby will greatly help in the upcoming sections and was well worth collecting the vials. Try your best not to miss it. When ready, jump into the well and into the primordial abyss. This area is basically hell with rivers of lava, towers of stone, and lots of demons. Wandering about this area, I couldn't help but compare it to sections of American McGee's Alice, which is a compliment, I assure you. The first to greet us here is the Village Idiot, now renamed to the Pet Worm Rider. The worm has definitely gotten bigger, with the Village Idiot being able to ride on its back. Unfortunately, it seems he wants to feed us to the monster and keep the portal open. We definitely can't have that. The fight that ensues is the first of three. You'll be given more ammo later, so feel free to lay into it with the ballista and the bare crossbow. It's not hard to keep your distance from the worm as long as you don't take too long to aim. Once defeated, the worm will flee. Giving chase to outside the cavern reveals a vast landscape of lava and stone. You remember that old woman with leprosy the sheriff had locked up back in Deadwell? Well, they are native here and several more old women with leprosy will attack you. They are an appropriate late game common enemy, but I can't help but notice their occasional hip sway, which is impressive for women of such advanced age. We'll eventually catch up to the idiot and his pet, now dubbed the Spider Worm Rider. The worm has now sprouted several spider legs and will occasionally spit out fire spiders to swarm us. And before you bring up the promise, we are not in the realm the promise was made, so it still isn't broken. Back to the boss battle, it is slightly more difficult than the previous fight, but the moment you realize the lava on the main floor doesn't hurt you and you can run around freely, it becomes significantly easier. Just keep distance from the spiders while popping shots at the worm. Remember, there is no need to hop over the lava cracks in the main arena. Save your speed. Once defeated, the worm flees again, this time to the top of a tower. Head off after them and onto this platform. Feels like a final battle now, right? We are trapped on this platform, but the worm is not. Now dubbed the Flying Spider Worm, the creature has spouted massive wings. What's more is that the idiot has tied massive knives to the beast's legs, because it wasn't bad enough before. Now is when the pushback of the ballista comes into play. Watch your footing and ammo, as both are easy to lose track of. Take the time to aim, as the hitbox to do damage on the creature is far smaller than it looks. It works best to aim at the rider, specifically his lower torso. The creature will drop to slash at you with its legs, and the dive is the best time to hit as it will also cancel out their attack. Keep in mind that they are also not above double dipping. One last good hit, and the village idiot, the knives, and the beast will all fall to the ground below. Be careful walking back and remember to save. Let's head on home. That bastard fucking lived. And what's worse is that he gets through the Dimensional Violator before we can close it. We have no choice but to follow it through wherever it goes.
We are back in Norway, specifically on a small island in a forest pond. The night is beautiful and the flora is magical in appearance, with bluish trees and mushrooms. At the end of a small torch trail is... The entire town? The remaining residents of Deadwell are here, as well as the flute player. They were no doubt summoned by him, which brings up many more questions in its own right. That doesn't matter right now, though. While we currently have the last dimensional violator, the village idiot wants to steal it again. The flute player wants to teach the idiot a lesson. We will do a ritual that will cause the device to explode the next time someone comes through it before letting him steal it again. The ritual in question is in the form of a laser rave party. Nice. While the party is active, we need to protect the device by stealing it back from the idiot whenever he takes it. While we play the strangest game of keep away, plant elementals of increasing difficulty will attack us. Just keep yourself between the device and the forest and the idiot will walk right into you before getting far. Don't worry about ammo as you attack the plant creatures, and the rotating crossbow should take care of most of them until the larger variants start to spawn. The whole thing will go faster than you think. When the flute player tells you, let the idiot take the device and ascend the tower for the final battle of the game. You can take a quick moment to heal as the final battle doesn't start until you take the final situational weapon. The Anti-Worm Crossbow it works similarly to the Ballista, but with unlimited ammo and very fast reload times. Good, because the idiot's pet is alive and here. The pet has turned from a worm, as in slang for a snake or limbless lizard, to a worm, as in dragon. It has shed off its legs in favor of breathing fire. Like before, it will fly around, swooping in to attack. While you would ideally hit it while it is spitting fire at you, I found it much more effective to take the damage and hit the creature as it flew away from the swoop. You can hit the wings now, so aiming is easier in that regard. And with one last good hit... We wake up on our boat, back on the waters that got us lost in the first place. All seems like it could have been a dream, save for the flute player's raven holding one last note. The idiot lived, with us having broken his fall. The worm, though, is dead. So hopefully the idiot would no longer seek the dimensional violators. Should I need you again, I will surely sink your boat when you least expect it. I knew it! That bastard! We cannot return to the island, but our employer has left us with a retirement gift. Northern Journey is one hell of a wild ride that captures everything I love in a great adventure story. The environments are awe-inspiring and fun to explore. The characters are interesting and unique. The enemies are all different and fit the setting. And everything comes together to create a fun and exciting tale. I love this game! The gameplay was simple but also used to advance the story while being enhanced by the story in turn. The gameplay never mismatched the setting and vice versa and wasn't afraid to shake things up and experiment. The fact that an FPS had multiple levels with no enemies says a lot on how the game wasn't afraid to be itself, which I attribute to the singular dev and the clear vision he had for this game. My only complaint about the story overall is the movie-style false endings we got at the end of the story. 
From the haunted glacier onward, it kept feeling like I had just beaten the game only for there to be another section. Though, that is probably mostly my fault for applying the expectations other FPSs have given me over the years to such a unique standalone title. A special note needs to be given for the excellent level design of this game. All the areas felt connected and were easy to navigate. Most levels looped into each other and previous areas perfectly, and there were plenty of unlockable shortcuts to aid my backtracking. More than once while playing, I couldn't help but admire the devs' forethought on how everything connects and flows. Let's talk about the music. For obvious reasons, most of the music in Northern Journey is ominous and medieval with the occasional voice cutting in for a haunting effect. It sounds great and suits the game well. To spice things up though, the music of the two concerts as well as the pet worm fight music is all a brilliant mix of folk, electronic rave, and synth remix. The resulting sound is very unique and gives a good intensity to match what's happening on screen. It's legit great. Overall, the music is extremely well done and enhances the game beautifully. Alright, as I said at the beginning, this game is a bit jank, which is to be expected of a full-length game done by one person. There is a few typos here and there, as well as the occasional weirdness. For example, I randomly slowed down and was unable to move at full speed multiple times during the fire spider worm battle. It mainly happened when I was hopping around, and enemies would run out of bounds sometimes once I got stuck, leading me to think I may have gotten stuck in the terrain. There is also the fact that the village idiot didn't spawn in the first time I entered Deadwell, leading me to wander around confused for an NPC who wasn't there. Not a good first impression, but what I could see was interesting enough for me to forgive it. While I went most of the game without a freeze, which is extremely impressive for a game like this, I did get one while on Changeling Island. Thankfully, every glitch I came across was fixed with the game reset. What's more is that the dev is still active and releasing patches. When I entered Dark Throat, its name in many places was Dark Dark Throat until a patch came out the day I recorded that section, fixing it. So yeah, while the game has a bit of jank, it is far, far better than most one dev games in that regard and seems to only be getting better. Slid Studio is already working on his next game. It appears to be another fantasy FPS, this time with a more of a Central European theme. You can already see how much he has improved from making Northern Journey, and I will be keeping a close eye on this game. If it is anywhere close to being as creative as Northern Journey, I know I'll like it. And I guess that's it. I knew from the first moment I wanted to show this game to as many people as possible, and I took great joy in playing it. This is a hidden gem just begging to be discovered by more people, and I hope I helped even if it's just a bit. If you are still on the fence about buying it, then take this as a metaphorical push. Go buy it. It is a wonderful experience that you simply can't get from a modern AAA game, and I have no doubt you'll enjoy it. If you want more info on the dev, to watch his full-length film, listen to the game's soundtrack, or get more info on his upcoming game, the Slid Studio YouTube channel will be linked in the description. There is also a one-on-one -on -one interview with the dev I'll also be linking below. If you want to see my initial blind reactions, I will link that playlist below as well. I left out a lot of my raw first opinions from this review, so go ahead and check that out if interested. Finally, I humbly request you leave a like on this video, share it with anyone interested, leave a comment on your favorite or least favorite species of spider, and sub to the channel. Seeing how long this took to make, I'll be shifting my schedule from a set schedule to a whenever it is ready schedule, which will either lead to more or less reviews than originally planned depending on a bunch of unpredictable factors. I'll release one minute reviews whenever a full review won't be ready that week. Hopefully this will work out better for everyone. The future of this channel will definitely have more views about underrated gems, weird games, dinosaurs, VR games, and more of that nature. I really hope y'all look forward to it. Real talk though, if you are on the fence about subbing to this channel, it would help me immensely if you did so I can justify the time it takes to make these videos. And with that, farewell my friends. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I hope we shall meet again soon.